All right, so I got here on Wednesday and I was really looking forward to today to be able to spend time with three of our greatest mayors in this country. There's a few things we're gonna talk about. We're really gonna focus on infrastructure, innovation and inclusion, specifically around the country, but we have subject matter experts who deal with it every day. So um, with that said, I'm gonna thank Mayor Caldwell from Honolulu for coming down, all the way from Honolulu to be with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> See, even did that. See, it's for real. Um, Mayor Barnett, Rochester Hills, thank you. Let's give him a hand. And last but not least, we have my dear friend, Mayor Hancock of Denver. Everyone. So I had all of my questions on this device, but technology has let me down because the battery died out literally as I set it down here. <laughs> so uh, I'm gonna start with Mayor Barnett, the president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Um, as the president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, you have this 3i program. Tell us a little bit about it and how it's going to impact and change the country and the mayors that are involved with the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Great, well, just so you know, we weren't gonna answer your questions anyway, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, inviting us uh, here and for uh, giving mayors a little bit of time uh, to share some of the innovative things we're doing. Uh, I'm blessed to be the uh, president of the United States Conference of Mayors, an organization started back in the 1930s uh, to support cities and represent uh, uh, those folks that, uh, that live in our urban areas. There are about 1,400 cities in the country, over 30,000 uh, populations, and that's a group that we're all a part of. And, you know, if you think about even the differences between Honolulu, Rochester Hills, which you're probably Googling right now to find out where that's at, uh, and Denver, <laughs> uh, you know, it might be hard to think about what unites three very different cities geographically about as far as you could be, populations very different. And what we've really circled on uh, is there's three things that bind us together. Uh, Infrastructure, we all have major infrastructure needs. In Denver, it might be an airport. In my city, it's, it's roads and neighborhood streets. And in Kirk City, it, it could be ports and, and different things related to the sea. Uh, but infrastructure needs continue to be massive uh, drains on our resource and our time and our bandwidth, trying to figure out how we're going to meet the uh, infrastructure needs of our community. Innovation, all of us are trying to figure out how to serve our communities uh, in more efficient ways, harnessing many of the things that you and your companies are doing. Uh, we love to be laboratory. For, for innovation, so we feel like innovation, innovation is really the key for cities to be able to continue to lead and connect with their, with their residents. And then all of us are dealing with massive changes uh, as it relates to our, our city's populations. Uh, if you're a city that's not embracing uh, full inclusion, uh, you're going to be left behind. And inclusion has a lot of definitions. It's not just maybe what you see or what's talked about uh, initially on, on, on television so often, but it has to do with economic disparity and, 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 and giving really every person in every neighborhood and every zip code a chance to be successful, whether they live in Hawaii, Colorado, or Michigan. So those three things really overlap and, and and we find uh, that they, they really speak to every city, no matter what their major issues are. Those are the things that we're focused on and we're trying to, uh, to bring closer to home to our residents back in our cities. Now, so with that said, you know, at Ignite, we focus on supporting the alignment for, layers, uh, uh, for mayors on smart city solutions that can scale, replicate, and become profitable. Um, knowing that infrastructure, inclusion, and innovation are priorities, Mayor Hancock, knowing how close you are to the people of Denver, What's inspiring projects in your city? What direction are you headed and what's up, what are your priorities? And tell us a little bit about those priorities. I appreciate that, George. First of all, hello, ATL. We're glad to be here from wherever you are around the country, <laughs> around the world. Uh, it's good to be with you. Listen, you know, I want to put it in context. Denver recently has been known as the fastest growing city in the country, population-wise. In fact, just looking at some statistics, Denver grew by over 200,000 people in the last decade. Oh, wow. Uh, moving to a city. So you have to begin to get up on innovation and you have to get up on efficiencies as quickly as possible. And there are a couple things that we've done. One, we got to really focus on mobility. You don't grow that fast without, without having an impact on your public infrastructure and the way people get around the city. 
Um, and so we're, we have looked at technology as a way to move people faster right. and more efficiently around our city. The other thing is how do we deliver services more directly to our people in a very innovative, efficient way? And so we look at a couple things. One, we train our employees, city employees, and empower them to help us identify how we can improve processes, number one. And then two, how can we use technology to help with any, any innovations they've come up with? Sometimes it's not technology. Sometimes it's just uh, it could be just processes. Let me give you a couple quick examples. In 2011, when I became mayor, if you walked into our human services um, department, you, it took you and requested food stamps. It could be anywhere from three to seven days before you got your food stamps. Mm. Because city employees were empo trained and empowered to innovate, they looked at the process first and realized that we had steps in the process that brought us no value. It only delayed it. Today, um, eight years later, 98% of all food stamps are approved and delivered within the 24 hours of walking wow. in the building. That's a different maker. The average wait time in our DMV was an hour, 20 minutes when I became mayor. Today, it's 17 minutes. Wow. Employees innovating and technology backing it up. So we kind of empower people. But you got to start with the people, empower them, and then use the technology to help you innovate. So, but I have a really big question for you that I'm sure everybody in the audience wants to know. Um, how bad are the Bears going to beat the Broncos on Sunday? <laughs> you know, you know. At first, Just tell I, us the truth. They, they, they won't, <laughs> unless some of our players get a hold of some of that product in Colorado. But we're not going to let that happen. <laughs> uh, uh, with that said, now, uh, Mayor Caldwell, you and I have had a number of conversations in Honolulu, here, and other places about infrastructure and important. You have a number of amazing infrastructure-based projects going on. Tell us about those. Well, first of all, good afternoon and aloha to everybody. I want to thank you all for sticking around to the bitter end. I think they <laughs> saved the best for last with yeah. Mayor Hancock <laughs> and Mayor Barnett. And uh, in case you didn't catch it, George is from Chicago. And of course, you know Mayor Hancock <laughs> is from Denver, so he's a little biased. Yeah. But I'm, I'm going to believe yeah. what Mayor Hancock has to say. <laughs> oh, Thank you, sir. Um, in, in terms of infrastructure, you know, we have, City and County of Honolulu is about a million people. It's an island crowded with people, crowded between the mountain and the sea. And one of the things we're building is our first rail system, inner city rail system, about 20 miles, 21 stations, $9.2 billion project. The first driverless rail system in our country. It's copied after one that's in Copenhagen. But for me, that project, this project, is about, it is infrastructure, massive infrastructure, most expensive infrastructure ever built in Hawaii, but it's about inclusion. It's about helping people live on the edge of town, basically native Hawaiians who can't afford to pay for the real estate close to where they work to get to work and home quicker in 44 minutes instead of an hour and a half to two hours so they can be with their families or be at work. So that's why it's so important, I think, that the Conference of Mayors has adopted this mm -hmm. infrastructure innovation inclusion. If you do it correctly, we move our cities forward, we thrive, but we bring everyone along. And I think any great city, whether it be a great city of Athens or the ancient city of Rome or you know, Angkor Wat or Incas or Aztecs, whatever it is, people thrive when you build infrastructure that's forward thinking and everyone moves forward together. So that's why this topic is important. I don't, wanted to mention one other thing. Mayor Hancock talked about the wait lines at our, at, at, for getting your motor vehicle registration. City and County Honolulu, same thing, long lines. Still, lines are pretty long. We've worked hard on it. But one thing we did is we have kiosks, so that's innovation. It's a form of infrastructure. We have eight satellite city halls, but we have these kiosks now in a number of our supermarkets that are open 24 seven. And you can go register your vehicle at these kiosks. They've been up just a month and a half and we've registered 18,000 vehicles. People don't need to go to a city hall. They don't need to stand in line. They can do it while they shop and it takes about four minutes. That's just an example, simple, not that expensive, but can really change how people interact with government. And I think as mayors, we need to make our interaction easier, more simple for our citizens. And that's one example of how we do that. And it sounds like Mayor Hancock has done that too. You know, um, sticking to the three I's, 
every mayor deals with challenges that we don't really talk about, things that we have to sort of fight or, or rethink or challenge our entire team. Can you talk about, well, we have some great improvements, innovation happening. Where are the, what are the areas, what are the issues that almost mayors across the country, because there's probably some similarity in them, that they're dealing with that they're having trouble with? Where, where are the pressure points? And maybe what could we do differently to move away from them or resolve them? Well, it, you know, the, um, there's a lot of that. That's a great question. Um, you know, I, I was thinking about this, and I think there's a, a you know, for, for mayors that really want to be progressive, not in the political sense, but just in the sense of leading their communities, at least we try to preach this in Rochester Hills. We don't view our competition as certainly Honolulu or Denver or even communities that are near us. We view our competition as Amazon, uh, as Disney, as Nordstrom, uh, because that's the type of service uh, levels that our residents uh, are, are used to and expect. So if they can order something on Amazon and have it in, in, in 14 hours or 24 hours, but it takes them you know, a day and a half to get a, a dog license or, a, or permit at the DMV, uh, they're they're frustrated. So, you know, I think one of the things that I, I guess I'd, I'd certainly want to impress upon this talented group in the room is that we are certainly open to those suggestions. We don't necessarily know the technologies that exist. What are the challenges we're facing? We weren't facing this challenge as much as we are now in the last four months, but I spent Monday in Washington, D.C. In, in, the, in the White House with the President's team, Tuesday with Mitch McConnell. Gun violence is a major issue in the United States right now, and every city is trying to figure out how they can harness technology to better respond respond, to better prepare their residents, uh, and to make sure that we are, unfortunately, you know, in, in the best situation possible to be prepared for what, what could happen. And so it wasn't something that any of us probably ran on, uh, that, you know, we're going to have the best prepared city uh, for, for mass shootings, but it's something that it's a reality now. And as you know, there's been 260 shootings in this, in this nation since the start of this year. So, um, you know, whether it's mass shootings, whether it's communicating with our residents, whether it's uh, finding ways to, to be better stewards of our climate and of our environment, uh, cities really are the laboratories of innovation, and we are open to trying to pilot some of these projects and, and, and issues and, and the solutions that many times the private sector is so far ahead of us in, in adapting. Agreed. Let, let, let me, and I, I agree with Mayor Barnett and Mayor Caldwell, let me share something with you. I don't think we as a, uh, in the current state in terms of our society, acknowledge the powerful moment that we're living in. This is the most transform transformational moment since the advent of the television. Absolutely. And that our technologies are changing. And when we're all, you know, 75, 80 years old, we're going to look back and go, we didn't realize we were in that moment. You know, and it's, what, it, what it's really doing is going to test our understanding and our sensibilities of the very things that we care most about. And let me give you an example. Um, I'm in um, a little town in South Korea. And they take me into their intelligence gathering room. And in, the, in most cities around the country, including Atlanta, there are halo cameras everywhere. They have the ability, if there is a bank robbery, for example, to set up a virtual um, net hmm. that could do facial recognition. Hmm. So I gave the facial recognition word, which today is being debated by constitutional scholars, Groups are pushing back on. And that's what I'm talking about is that cities, states across this world, around the world, are using facial recognition to keep their citizens safe. Many airports in the United States use facial, including Denver, use facial recognition to identify someone who has been identified as no-fly, um, terrorist, potential terrorist, right? They're on yep, the no-fly list. But if you try to advance that to keep the general public safe, now we've got a civil liberties issue and people are pushing back. Now, not saying for or against it, but it's beginning to call in the question, do we want to advance our safety or increase our safety as a city and as citizens and begin to call ourselves or require us to interpret differently what it right. means in terms of our privacy? Or do we maintain and say, no, the strict understanding of what the United States Constitution says is that I have a right to my privacy and you don't have a right to interpret who I am based on my facial recognition. So it, we are being really going to be, we're all going to be confronted with this question. So the fine it's line. Gonna, it's going to happen. It's happening right. now. Right. But we all get ready because this is a transformational moment and this, these technologies are going to call us to really be honest with what do we really want? 
True. Mayor Call. So, you know, I was listening to Mayor Hancock. His uh, city has grown by 200,000 in the last decade. Wow. And the city and county of Honolulu has shrunk by 12,000 in the past two years. And where people are moving is the people born and raised in Honolulu are moving to other parts of the continent where land is cheaper, housing is cheaper. Yes, people are we're growing in some ways. It would even be more of a drop. People are moving in, but people with money. The average price of a home in Honolulu is $830,000. And so, and the cost, milk, everything is much more expensive. And for me, it, it, it's interesting because you have one of the lowest unemployment rates of any city in the country. I bet you Denver too, probably your city. And if, when we do polls and I ask people, are we moving in the right direction or the wrong direction? Low unemployment, booming economy, tourism is strong, military spending is strong, construction is strong. The majority of the people say we're going in the wrong direction. And I think it has to do with this movement between classes, you know, the very wealthy doing very well and everyone else kind of dropping and working harder to stay in place. And, and that breaks my heart. And, you know, how do you help your citizens feel that the future is going to be better than it, in, than it is right now for their children and grandchildren. And part of it for me is things like our rail project. If you don't need to have two cars or no car, just one car, no car, that means for in Honolulu, 14,000 more dollars in your pocket to pay for rent or for your mortgage or food. If you can provide through our bike share some way for people to use the bus or rail and then ride the rest of the way, that helps. So I'm looking for those types of technology that make it a more fair and equitable place to live on a very small island. With that said, we've touched a little bit on infrastructure and innovation. And I've been fortunate to, to know all three of you and work on a number of different ideas. Every one of you and every other mayor we know is always working to build a great city. And in fact, it should be a great city for everybody. How do we deal with inclusion? You know, if we're talking innovation, infrastructure, how does in inclusion fall into it and how do we ensure that everybody's at the table? Well, you know, I don't want this to be uh, a, a, a small thing, but it starts by at least talking about it. So I'm a Republican mayor from a, a fairly upper class, uh, mostly white community in, in suburban metro Detroit. And he's a really good guy. And <laughs> a Republican. He's really like, amazing. Nice and they guy. haven't they haven't thrown me out yeah, yet up here. So how about that? <laughs> um, and and so you know when I looked at our community, I thought, well, people think of Rochester Hills as rich and white. I want to do something to change that because it's not. I mean, there's a portion of our community that's like that, but we also have the the third largest Asian population in Michigan. We have the largest Albanian Catholic church in the world. We have the second largest mosque in Michigan. But people don't talk about that. So we went out of our way to be intentional about making sure that everything that the city did, even, go, even as simple as going and looking at our publications, you think you're a, a diverse organization, look at the last 10 things you've put out as an organization and tell me if that is reflective of the diversity that you hope to show. You in go. our city, it wasn't. You know, it was a bunch of white kids on playgrounds, right? Um, and so we wanted to go back and be really intentional about making sure that we wanted to, to show from a city standpoint who we wanted to be uh, to the world. And I put together the, uh, a mayor's inclusion, uh, uh, equity and diversity committee. And we began to reach out all into the, to the faith communities, to the, uh, to the different parts and, and pockets of people that needed to be at the table. It starts, I think, with mayors being really intentional. And if you're a mayor, it's about being intentional. If you're a CEO or a key member of your organization, it's about being intentional about it. And my city was just starting with a conversation. They say, what's this? Rochester Hills has a diversity and equity committee? That's, why? Um, but we've gotten some great feedback. We have really gotten to become, I think, more in touch with who we want to be and where we want to go. Because I'm telling you, communities and businesses and organizations that don't are not going to be around. Um, it, it just is that simple. I mean, it, it's, it's the way our nation is going. It, and, and, and it certainly, it makes me a better mayor. And I think it makes us better communities when we reach out and make sure that every voice is, is, is the, we use the word belong. It feels like they belong at the table and at the future in Rochester Hills. Thank you for that. Thank you. Mayor Hancock? You know, if you really, we're going to really be honest about inclusion, we have to use the E word, which is equity. And equity is really about, and when you commit to the values of equity, you're really committing to the incremental um, investment of opportunities, meeting people where they are. It's not everybody, you, you reject the idea that everybody's starting from the same position. The reality is, is that 
cities like Denver have experienced a tremendous economic expansion over the last 10 years. But not everybody has come along in the same way in that economy. In fact, as a, our former Vice President Joe Biden shared with me, the greatest threat to the United States of America is economic stagnation, wage stagnation. Mm. It is driving a lot of the disruptions we are seeing in our cities around the country. It is social justice, but people who are tired, sick and tired of seeing everybody else get richer, seeing this economic gap get wider, are saying, enough of this. When do we get ours, and what about us? And cities that refuse or don't move to address increasing minimum wage, for example, so that people can have a livable wage and survive and take care of their families and have the basic dignity of keeping a roof over their heads and feeding their family without the worries of how they're going to do it, are cities that are going to continue to find disruptions in their communities. And so mayors like Mayor Barnett and Mayor Codwell and myself think about how do we help lift up folks in this great economic prosperous time knowing that not everybody starts from the same position, but incrementally invest in certain people to give them the same advantage point to look over that fence and say, I too can pursue that opportunity. Stopping gentrification and, and, mis and displacement of folks and recognizing that when we recruit you know, certain businesses and opportunities and we move in to make public investments, we have to ask the question, how are the most vulnerable impacted by this? Mm. Not that they don't deserve it, but how do we make sure we protect them as we move in so they don't lose their home and the property values don't push them out? These, that's what equity is all about, and that's what inclusion is about, saying you deserve new parks, libraries, hospitals, just like any other neighborhood. We're going to bring it, but we also got to protect you because you don't have the same vantage point over that fence as everybody else. It's powerful. So George is with a company called Ignite. That's why I got to know him. And he introduced the city and county of Honolulu to MasterCard to work on a thing we call a key card or a, a, a city ID card. And we're moving forward with this. And my dream is that every citizen in the city and county of Honolulu will have the, this card. It will be used to ride the bus or to ride rail or to get a Bicky bike. That's our bike share. It could be uploaded with money if you're a homeless person, to allow you to purchase certain types of things um, that you need just to, to, to live um, at basic needs in the city and county of Honolulu, that perhaps it will be given, this card will be used to when we face, because of the climate crisis, hurricanes that are approaching, huge rain bombs, you know, 50 inches of rain dropping in a 24-hour period, but give our first responders this card so they can go out and actually spend money immediately in communities where it needs to be spent with certain kind of restrictions. This is using technology and innovation, but it's helping those who need it the most, homeless folks, um, people who are being ravaged by a flood in a valley or the impacts of the sea rising. Um, and I think in that way, there is great hope for everybody because when we face these challenges, those with money, tend to be able to recover more quickly. They can buy 14 days of food. You know, they say hurricanes come and get 14 days of food. About a third of our population gets, has just one day of food. They're buying food every day. They can't do that. So this is a way we could help them be better prepared. So it's just one of the things I've learned by coming to events like this and meeting people like George and then the MasterCard folks to help us bring us forward. Thanks. Well, that's, that's very powerful. Uh, and first, you know, thank you to all three of you for not only talking about Three Eyes, but applying it. We have a, a couple of minutes left, so I wanted to see if we could take a few questions, maybe two questions from the audience for the mayors regarding infrastructure, innovation, or inclusion, or any of the topics or any of the statements that were said here. Do we have anyone that would like to ask a question? Hi, um, my name is Sonia Booker, and um, Mayor Hancock, you said something really interesting when you started about how you are empowering employees to really be part of the innovation. And sometimes I just wonder, how do you, how did you find that work when people um, seem to see innovation sometimes as like 
a way out of a job? Like if we innovate too much or make things too great, are there incentives or, or how did you implement that? That was very interesting. Great question. What we did was we created an initiative called Peak Performance. And within Peak Performance, we actually set up a training program for city employees where they got certified black belt or green belt. Black belt was a one month training program, green belt was one week. But the idea was we trained them on process, continuous process improvement. Once they got certified, now they were considered the elite city employees, right? Today, there are over half of our 11,000 city employees who are black belt certified. And they got it, so they spent a whole uh, three weeks being trained on, in those process improvements. Now, now that you certify, it's part of your employee um, evaluation that you have to go back and innovate. And now I have a five, 6,000 internal consultants. If I got a problem in the city, I go and randomly, we go and randomly select five black belts and we send them to a department to help us solve a problem. And they love that and they feel like ownership, but we also gave them empowerment. We're gonna return some of these resources back to city employees. You save the city money based on improving our processes, we're gonna invest in healthcare programs for city employees. We gave them, instead of, you know, we give it uh, the eco pass for buses. It used to be $40 a month, it's now $10 a month. We gave it back to the city employees. Yeah, that was a great question. Before great I take question. the second one, I wanted to quickly say thank you to Artie, who might be here, I think she's back there, and the Smart City Atlanta team for inspiring this yeah. conversation. Let's give her a hand. Yeah. Come on up Artie, real quick. Up. Mar Artie, Artie, come on up. Come on up. Uh, come on up, Artie. Come on up, Artie. Uh, we'd like to say thank you Artie. because without Artie, Artie, <laughs> without Artie uh, this wouldn't have happened. And I think it's appropriate to at least uh, send much gratitude and um, extend our thank you for giving us an opportunity to, um, to be here today. So thank you for that. I'm gonna give you a big hug. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. Congratulations. Yeah. Hey, have a seat with us for a second. So we're gonna take the last question really quick and then we're gonna turn it over because I think, think T.I. is in the building. I think he's somewhere in here. He might be in this building. Um, here you go. By the way, I Michael, tweeted out to my kids that I'm opening for T.I. today, just so you know. That's <laughs> And I told the mayor, technically, story. he is. Oh, go ahead. My name's Missy Goss, and I've lived in New York, Chicago, San Francisco, and I moved to Atlanta to get my MBA from Emory. And this is the first city that I've lived in where I've needed a car to get around. I was curious, Mayor Caldwell, if you faced any pushback with getting this transit um, plan going and what you did to get people on board. You know, I've, um, that's a very great question and um, huge pushback. Um, highly controversial, remains controversial in terms of a rail project. And, you know, it reminds me of something that um, Ambassador Young said two days ago, very inspiring about, you just got to step up and fight for some of these things. He talked about the airport here. He talked about this incredible convention center, the Olympics, but the leadership shown. Um, these kind of projects are going to be highly controversial because they're different, they're large, and it change, it's a mindset. You know, even our bike share, putting in protected bike lanes, car share, and taking parking spaces away from people who want to park there but not share a car, are all things that create some concern and pushback. Change is difficult. But I think, you know, the mayor is sitting here, and mayors, for sure, the mayors of Atlanta, were visionary and dreamed a big dream and didn't step away from the controversy. And today, this city is incredible. It's the first time I've been to the South, and I thought Atlanta, what they've done and the leadership shown, gives me courage to go back to Honolulu and continue to push and fight for these innovative transportation initiatives we've undertaken. Yeah. I would say one thing real quickly. I come from the Metro Detroit area where mass transit is like a swear word. You know, we, we built vehicles and everyone should have four uh, is sort of our motto. Um, one thing I think is unique, and this is changing in, in my area, and that is we, we, one thing that keeps me up at night when I'm super excited about is the, the advent of the autonomous vehicle. To me, that is something that's going to be the next game changer for transportation, certainly in a region that doesn't have mass transportation, what it can do to my for my disabled community, uh, for my, my, my underprivileged community, what it will do to, to, to level the field for, for access. 
uh, I want to be the laboratory for innovation relative to autonomous vehicles in Metro Detroit. I want it to happen first in my city, and I will partner with anybody who helps bring it to me quickly because I think that's going to make a huge change in how we move people around uh, and, 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 me and measures and issues of equity. If I can just say this very quickly because we got to go. There, we talked about equity. We've talked about inclusion. I want you to understand there is nothing that creates a, 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 a faster level playing field, brings about a, a level playing field, field faster than mobility. Yeah. And when you remove the barriers, and automobiles are very costly, you remove that barriers with bicycles and affordable transit, now you're giving people access to opportunities. You tell me a neighborhood or show me a neighborhood that has limited mobility options and I'll show you where poverty exists. There you go. That's why it's go. such a powerful and important opportunity. Well, I want to say thank you to everybody on the panel. Artie, thank you once again. I know uh, we're going to exit. Thank you to everyone who stayed to participate. Without you, this doesn't happen. So thank you to everyone here. Artie, would you like to say anything? I'm, I'm so honored uh, to be supported by this community, to be supported by friends more than anything who are here to solve critical challenges in our cities. And I look forward to building with all of you. Everyone can contact me. I'm happy to respond. I want to hear all of your ideas. And I'm really looking forward to ending this day with John Hope Bryant, T.I., and Rose Scott, and I look for, and you guys, you opened for TI, you absolutely did, so <laughs> thank you.